he's asked because he thinks he's pleasing the doctor. He wants to do that. There are others who are so stoic, so even they may be having a life-threatening problem, but they hardly mutter as to what is happening to them. There are others who overplay their symptoms, and the physician should be able to recognize that. And there are others who speak so many things, a dime to a dozen, so it's difficult to find out what really is the essence of the matter. I think the art of medicine lies in looking at the patient holistically, the mind and the body. He may come to you with symptoms resembling a disorder of an organ or an organ system. But really, these symptoms might be originating in his mind. The anxiety, the frustrations, the pressures that he is up with, the problems, the failures in a life today which is bedeviled by anxieties and frustrations all over in all parts of the world. I'm going to give you a story to illustrate the meaning of how important the history is. It's a nice story. A girl of about 22 or 23 or 24, at the end of the day, comes with her employer. She is apparently a very good business, and she was kind enough to come with this young girl of 22 or 24. She had had abdominal pain for six months, had a low-grade fever, had been to all the doctors, had had every conceivable investigation done upon her, scans and endoscopies and whatnot. And finally, the GI specialist said, I have to give you anti-TB drugs. I might do a laparoscopy before, you do th before I do so. So they came to us. And I asked the history. And I realized that I couldn't go anywhere. She would just talk in monosyllables. Pain, yes. Where all over the abdomen. Literally, in, I was realized I was not getting anywhere as far as the history was concerned. And then you must always do one thing. You must ask the patient about topics which do not concern a disease. So, so I asked, which school did you go to? How long were you in school? What was your favorite subject? Monosyllables again. This, this, this. Not getting anywhere at all. Then I asked her, you like your work? She said, I love my work. Ah, I said, that's something. When do you start work? 7.30 in the morning, I have to be at the office. There was this employer of her sitting by her side. And when do you come back? 7.30 in the evening. When do you get up in the morning if you start work at 7.30? And then she says an important thing. I don't sleep well. I said, what time? She says, I go to sleep, go into bed at 11 o'clock or so, but I can't sleep till 3, 3.30, and I have to get up at 6 o'clock if I have to reach the office by 7.30. It's true. I said, you, a young girl, you work the whole day from 7 to 7, and you say you can't sleep for four hours? What's the reason? She says, I don't know. I'm surprised. You don't know why you don't sleep well? What are your plans, I ask. What do you propose to do? I p I'm very happy in my work. I propose to do well. She's given me, already has given me a raise, and I have a feeling that I am going to go further and further. And suddenly, almost as an aside, I tell her what? Is that all you want out of life? Don't you want to get married, a pretty girl like you? Don't you want to have a home of your own? Don't you want to have children of your own? There was a sudden tightening and a tear glistening in her eyes. She wouldn't talk. I said, if you tell me this, I tell you, I shall get rid of your fever and your pain in the abdomen. And then it comes out. I can't do so because I'm the sole earning member of my family. The father is an electrician. He gets day jobs. He can't support us. The mother is not well. And I have put my sister in a very good school. How can I marry? There was the problem. 
That was the problem. And that was the reason why she was expressing her anxieties and her stresses and her strains in physical form, the low-grade fever and abdominal pain. I looked at the employer and said, Madam, you can help. Surely you can employ the father who's an electrician in your big firm. And surely you can perhaps save the situation by giving him a reasonable salary so that he could run the house. The lady was a wonderful lady. She understood. She never knew this was so. She said, I'll do so, sir. I promise you I'll do so. They embraced each other. The ending was good. It had been a very bad day for me. I had lost a patient from a cardiac arrest, which we couldn't resuscitate. Patients were supposed to get better, had got worse. But I had a big smile on my face when I went home. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is an illustration of what the art of medicine is. Now, it is just as history taking as a forgotten art, physical examination also has begun, become a forgotten art. I've had patients coming from abroad even, doing their final years, and couldn't feel a spleen properly, couldn't use the stethoscope properly. It's a shame, and the answer is that we have so much time to do other things, learn other things, genetics, biophysics, biochemistry. We have no time to spend with the patient. That's a sad state of affairs. Clinical examination, is very important. It is both an art and a science. The art lies in eliciting physical findings. The science lies in interpreting those physical findings. It's no use knowing what a sign means if you can't elicit it. Therefore, the physician must learn to be able to see the relevant things. None are so blind as those who have eyes and yet not see. He must have the ability to hear, to touch, to feel. That is so very important. He must, be have, he must have then the ability to process what he has sensed within his brain, to bring forth past experiences and relate them to the present situation so that he can then weigh, judge, and decide what the problem with the patient is. I'm going to quote now one of the greatest clinicians of, the mo of present times, not present times, in the 1930s, William Osler. This is what he said, learn to see Learn to hear, learn to feel, and know that only with practice will you become perfect. Medicine is learned at the bedside, not in lecture halls. Do not base your conception of a disease from what you hear in the classroom or what you read in a book. See first, then judge, and then decide. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence, I think, of the art of medicine. Now, I must tell you something important, which perhaps doesn't belong either to art or science, and that is clinical judgment. Clinical judgment is very important. A doctor must needs be a judge. For after all, can you not, is not medicine defined as the art of coming to a conclusion with insufficient evidence? If that be so, mistakes are always made. But good clinical judgment, I think, is inborn in most patients. You cannot equate good clinical judgment with intelligence. I've seen some extremely intelligent individuals with poor judgment. And I've seen people with ordinary intelligence. 
with good clinical judgment. So can you improve on clinical judgment? Yes, you can, I guess. With experience, if you learn from your experiences, and if you have a wider interest in life, if you have studied the humanities, or if you have music, or you have languages, or philosophy, or religion, why is it so? A broader perspective of life makes you understand a human being much better. And therefore, you are a better physician. Please remember that to cope with a serious infection problem, and not necessarily an infection, an emergency, or a serious illness, it is not just enough to have knowledge, to have experience, to have logic, reason, skill. It requires good judgment. The hallmark of a good physician. Good judgment is a good blend of all that I said, but it has an added special intangible quality. The quality that enables a physician to have care, compassion, love, charity. A quality that enables the physician to have a clear, good understanding of human nature. A quality that can reach down to the shattered morale of a sick individual, support it. A quality can soothe a distressed mind, and how distressed it is, believe me, of a very sick patient. It is also the quality which enables a wise man, a wise clinician, to know what to say and do, and what not to say and do when to wait and watch, and when to start treatment immediately. 